The Toronto Spring Classic. This is one of the biggest auto auctions of its kind in Canada. There's a fellow moving through the crowd like a racing star. People shaking his hand, getting their picture taken. There are lots of cars on the block up for sale, but not just cars. There's also one other item in the lineup today, something that really flies. It was the pride of the Air Canada fleet. On a routine flight one beautiful day in 1983, uh, this is an when at 41,000 feet, it ran out of fuel. This guy already knows all about that. He's no race car driver. He is Captain Bob Pearson, the pilot who wrestled the Gimli glider to the ground when it looked very much like a critical miscalculation would cost everybody on board their lives. This is the room where I keep all my airline memorabilia. Oh, wow. yeah. Oh, there's a 767 That's there. That's the Boeing uh, 767, yes. Wow. Captain Bob Pearson was 47 years old back in 1983, a pilot at the top of his game, a game that was changing. People were in the streets protesting the official implementation of the metric system in Canada, but the government plowed ahead and Air Canada introduced its first metric plane. Much more fuel efficient, um, uh, quieter, uh, more powerful. I bid to, to be on the first course in Air Canada. I was excited. You were impressed. I was impressed, absolutely. Bob Pearson knew a lot about aerodynamics. He had already learned it years ago, back in the 60s, as a glider pilot and instructor at this club along the Ottawa River. The young pilot who offers to take him up today Thank you very much. Thank you. wasn't even born when Bob made his even more famous glider landing. There's a lot Bob Pearson can teach young Sam Clement Coulson about reading the conditions, about keeping your cool when things go horribly wrong and you find yourself under intense pressure one July afternoon, trying to glide a 132-ton jetliner onto an abandoned field in Manitoba. It's been here since the Second World War, abandoned by the military in the 70s, but back in July of 1983, it was still hopping as a raceway for local hot rod enthusiasts. On the afternoon of July 23rd, Keith Berglund was, as usual, tinkering with his ride. This was a race weekend, and we would race from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon. So this is the bike from 1983. Kerry Seabrook was just a kid. He and his buddies were going to spend the day watching the races, having a picnic, riding their bikes, it was, after all, family day, and the place was hopping. Just puttering around. Goofing around. Yep. <laughs> like you do. Exactly. Uh, Over 2,000 kilometers away in Montreal, passengers boarded Air Canada Flight 143 on their way first to Ottawa, then on to Edmonton. Pearl Dion was traveling with her husband Rick, himself an Air Canada maintenance technician, and their three-year-old son Chris. Rick pointed out the airplane that we um, that we were taking, and when I saw it, I had a, an awful feeling. And I, d I don't know why, d didn't know why, but I did have that awful feeling. The passengers didn't know it, but there was a problem. There was a, a problem with the flight management computer was, uh, was intermittently oper inoperative. It meant the fuel for the flight would have to be measured and calculated manually. Jeez, it's a beautiful evening. It sure is. 
for flight attendant Susan Jewett, an experienced crew member, it was going to be just another routine flight with a crew she loved to travel with. Then she heard about the problem. Of course, you know, this is when you're going, oh, you know, maybe there's going to be a delay because, you know, when they're talking a little longer than two minutes, then, you know, maybe there's a possibility of a, some kind of a mechanical. She was also a new mom, had just barely returned to work. Her 11-month-old Victoria was at home with her husband. But with any luck, she'd be home too in a couple of days. In Ottawa, the fuel levels are checked again. Finally, they get ready to depart. It was a nice, clear uh, after, late afternoon. We took off to the northwest, a clear blue sky. Captain Bob Pearson joked to his first officer, Maurice Cantel. I remember saying to, uh, to Maurice, for once, everything's working properly. <laughs> Famous last words. Famous last words, yeah. It came back to haunt us a little bit. The 61 passengers on Air Canada Flight 143 had settled in, high above the Ontario Northland. Fewer passengers meant an easy ride for flight attendant Susan Jewett. For us, it's always nice to have a light load, especially in the summer. Pearl Dion's nerves had finally settled down. Did you lose that feeling of uneasiness you had? Yes, I, I didn't. Uh, yes, I did at that time. I, I wasn't feeling uneasy at all. Those fuel calculations were behind them, thought Captain Bob Pearson. But I remember having a, f a feeling of uh, peace and tranquility, you know, everything, everything, like I said, everything was working fine. They were at 41,000 feet, cruising at close to 800 kilometers an hour when fuel pressure lights started coming on. There was no thought that we had a fuel problem because our, we've done all these fuel checks, we're getting ahead on fuel, our flight management computers are showing we have lots of fuel. So actually when I made an announcement to the passengers that we had some kind of a computer problem that we didn't understand, and then I was diverting the flight to Winnipeg. And did you think any more of it than that at that point? No, I didn't think any more of it. Little did you know. Little did we know, until the left engine failed. Uh, Winnipeg Air Canada, flight 1143. Number 143, go ahead. Yes, uh, we lost our uh, number one engine. We'll require all the trucks out. 143, check, okay. Captain Pearson throttles back, descending from 41,000 feet, changing course for Winnipeg. Yeah, I think it was 28,000 feet the, the right engine would fail. The cockpit went black. We lost all our instruments and the lights, and, and uh, uh, I must have said something like, what's going on, you know, like, and what's happening here? With only basic hydraulics left to control the aircraft, Pearson contacted Winnipeg Control again. Yeah, this is a Mayday, and uh, we require a vector uh, onto uh, the closest available runway. I just said, this is a Mayday situation. We have no... Uh, no engine power. Just so they were clear. So they would alert them to the fact that, you know, because they were, in my mind, they, they may not have understood the severity at that point of the problem. The flight attendants uh, told us to fasten our seatbelts, and I realized that something was the matter because they looked gray. They were, they had frightened faces, so I knew from just looking at them that something was drastically wrong. In the cockpit, First Officer Kintel frantically makes calculations and realizes Winnipeg is too far. The tower advises. You're approximately 12 miles from Gimli right now. Uh, where is it, on the right? On your right, about your four o'clock position. Do they have emergency equipment? Negative emergency equipment at all, just one runway available, I believe, and uh, no control and uh, no information on it. And uh, before, there will be nobody on the runway when we get there, right? Eh? Nothing? I don't know. I can't uh, tell you for sure.
On the ground in Gimli, the racers are just finishing for the day. Kerry Seabrook and his buddies decide to take a bike ride down the old runway. The racing was done and we were just puttering around. People on the ground are completely oblivious to what's about to happen. Flight 143 is still moving too quickly. With no air brakes, Pearson decides to perform an old glider maneuver, turning the 132-ton aircraft sideways into the wind to slow it down. It must have been quite scary in the back, and there was obviously some vibration. All Pearl Dion can think about is her little boy. He was looking at me with big, his big brown eyes, and I just felt so terrible because the, we had brought this little boy into the world and he was going to die. That, I, I, that was the outcome that I expected. Susan Jewett, too, is thinking of her child. I'm thinking she's going to be one year old and she won't have a mother. And um, it was, it was very hard on me. Kerry Seabrook and his buddies were pedaling away when... We saw a plane coming across the horizon and that immediately caught our attention. Kerry's buddies hightail it out of there, but he is frozen. And it's still coming in and getting bigger. The wheels touch down on the, uh, on the rear of the plane and the front of the plane touches down and the front landing gear gives way and now there's smoke and spark. I looked up and saw three boys on bicycles and that got the adrenaline really going. And finally it came to a stop probably 100, 150 feet in front of me and my friend Art says, uh, Carrie, you got to get out of there, there's jet fuel, it could explode. Back in the cabin, a new realization sets in. There was no fire. There is no breaking of the airplane. The galley is all together because I'm by the galley and nothing's come out of the galley. And that's when I said we made it. <laughs> I knew that we were going to be okay. Everything stopped. When everything stopped and everybody just, just started clapping and they and shouting. Everyone is safe. By the evening, the first news film crews had pictures. Bob Pearson's landing of the Gimli Glider quickly became known as one of the most amazing feats in Canadian aviation history, or indeed, in the world. That was 30 years ago. So, where is it now? 10 o'clock, and it's over 40 degrees Celsius. Here in the boneyard of the Mojave Desert Airport. This is one of seven major places in the United States where planes come to rest. Eric Hanvelt is an aviation grave digger of sorts. So this is it. This is it, the famous Gimli. Kind of neat, owning a piece of aviation history. Since 2008, what is arguably Air Canada's most famous aircraft, number 604, has been sitting right here. Welcome there aboard. You. Thank you. Wow. Just amazing, eh? Well, this is where they sweated it out. That's where Susan Jewett would have been sitting right there. And that's, that's all she would have been able to see and what was going on through that little window. I've always wondered how one of these things works, so you pull that, pull this, pull down, out it comes. set it on the seat. So that's what they would have done? Yep. Look at that. The emergency door to the wing, where one of the emergency slides was deployed. Sounds like there's no fuel. <laughs> Just a little joke. So you can see Air Canada right along there, yeah. But what happened back in 1983, after Flight 143 got safely to the ground, was no laughing matter. An inquiry that would see his employer try to point the finger directly 
at pilot Bob Pearson. Airline leadership was in full damage control. The president and CEO yeah. jobs, they were on 30 days notice by the federal cabinet. Like I say, it was a Crown Corporation. Yeah. They feared for their jobs. As far as Air Canada brass was concerned, it was pilot Bob Pearson's fault, along with his first officer, Maurice Cantel, and ground support crews, that the plane ran out of fuel. I'm just asking you whether you knew how much fuel was going on that aircraft. The inquiry would take almost a year and a half and cost a million dollars. Flight logs showed repeated problems with the sophisticated aircraft fuel monitoring system, problems that were not fixed. The Gimli glider was also one of the first metric aircraft in Air Canada's fleet. Problems converting fuel volume to metric were exacerbated because there were no proper manuals or procedures in place. In the end, Judge George Lockwood found Air Canada at fault for the near disaster and commended Pearson and his crew for the way they handled a potentially deadly situation. Bob Pearson has had 30 years to think about that. It all came down to uh, putting an airplane in the service before proper training. I don't know about the training from the maintenance people didn't seem to understand a lot of what they were doing too. Um, we didn't, I didn't understand. We, you know, we trained on this three pilot airplane for, uh, they didn't have all the computerization, you know, and now we're jumping on an airplane with, without any background knowledge of the system. In the end, Air Canada was ordered to improve procedures and lines of communication. But Bob Pearson's incredible feat did something else, too. It changed jet pilot training around the world. I was operating a 767 flight uh, maybe six months after the Gimli uh, yeah. landing, and a, an SAS, Scandinavian Airlines uh, captain, came up and introduced himself. He said, within three weeks of our landing, uh, it became uh, part of SAS pilots' uh, training, uh, training yeah. to do a dead stick landing. It has even been suggested those new training regimes played a role in 2001 when an air transat jetliner ran out of fuel and glided to the Azores and the more recent Miracle on the Hudson in 2009. As for the Gimli glider, after 25 more years incident-free, it was retired in 2008. It's been sitting here baking in the desert sun ever since. Putting the first bidder on the plane. Who gets three million? Three million dollars. The hope was that someone would step forward at this spring's auction to bring it back, perhaps to Gimli. But the plane still worth an estimated three million dollars didn't sell. Eric Hanbelt says its fate is not quite sealed yet. Now there's some uh, new interest uh, in trying to get it back home. After 38 years of commercial flight, most of it without incident, Bob Pearson also retired. He's not an emotional guy, and he rejects any notion that he's a hero. But he is proud that he did his job that day as a pilot. I guess that was a day you won't soon forget, Bob. I guess I'll never forget it. And um, yeah, it was uh, a game changer in my career and in my life. You know, it, uh, it's opened a lot of doors and uh, made life actually a lot more interesting. There is one other thing, something Bob Pearson wouldn't talk about on camera. When his time comes to be laid to rest, he's decided he would like that place to be where he safely got everybody home, where he performed one of the most incredible feats in Canadian aviation history. He's thinking he'd like to be brought back right here. Red Sharon, CBC News, in Gimli, Manitoba.